Hello everyone, a very good morning and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. For today's discussion, I have chosen 12 important articles from the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper. So let's take a look at these topics. We have three important columns lined up for a detailed discussion and we have several articles that are relevant for your prelims examination. So stay with me for the next one hour, one hour, ten minutes. We will comprehensively discuss all these topics so that you don't have to go back and read the newspaper again. I hope you guys are liking these initiatives. I hope you're benefiting from it. And if yes, do extend the support to us by pressing the like button, by sharing your comments and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And also after the session ends, head to our telegram channel because we have a quiz on these topics. Do take these questions to help revise these articles again. So let's begin with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at this important column on page number 14. This column is examining the Digital Data Protection Bill, the Personal Data Protection Bill 2023, which has been tabled in the parliament by the government of India. In the ongoing monsoon session, this important bill has been introduced in the Lok Sabha by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology and hence it becomes important to examine the provisions of the bill. In fact, in the last few weeks, we have already had a couple of discussions on the personal data protection bill. But still the topic is so important that we have to carry out a thorough analysis of this bill which is likely to be passed in the monsoon session or maybe in the upcoming session. So first let's look at the context, let's understand what exactly is personal data, why it should be protected and then examine the provisions of the bill. As I told you, the topic is in news because the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill 2023 has been introduced in the Lok Sabha. Previously, the government of India had introduced a personal data protection bill back in 2018, but that bill had triggered a lot of controversy. It had been opposed by opposition parties and the joint parliamentary committee which had reviewed the previous bill had suggested several amendments. So because of the controversy surrounding the previous bill, the government had withdrawn this bill in 2022. Now the government has come out with a fresh bill, a completely new bill which has been tabled in the Lok Sabha. So it essentially seeks to protect your personal data. See today, in the world of information technology, in the world of the fourth industrial revolution, data is the new oil, data is the new gold, right? The digital data that we generate, this is what has become the primary driver of today's economy. All the emerging critical technologies, be it artificial intelligence, 5G, 6G, communication networks, internet of things, big data, all these technologies are dependent on data. They are driven by data. So ensuring your data privacy and protecting your data from any unauthorized access is extremely crucial. So guaranteeing data security and data privacy is critical and that is the reason why such a data protection law is necessary. So when we say personal data, it essentially refers to the data which is associated with a living person. The personal data, the intimate data behind a living individual is referred to as personal data. Now, if you look at the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regime of the European Union, it defines personal data as the data related to an individual person. If you look at this personal data, you can identify the living person behind it. Such data is classified as personal data. So this will include your name, your gender, date of birth, your biometric details, your address, your workplace, your personal preferences and as well as your health information, the IP address of the device from which you are accessing the internet and your choices and behavioral traits, etc. So 
So all these characteristics, these traits which are captured right through computer systems and this data which is stored in a digitized format, this constitutes digital personal data. Now since the data is directly linked with this individual, it's very important to safeguard and protect the data because any unauthorized access to this data will breach the privacy and data security of the individual. That's why around the world, countries are trying to bring in data protection laws to protect personal digital data. Is that clear? So this bill is specifically focused on protecting your personal digital data. Because when we say data, data could also be non-digitized. Data which is written down in books, in registers, in records, which is not di in digital form, which is not stored in computers and servers. That data can't be protected through the bill. This bill, this law which is being proposed in India is specifically meant for digital data. Data which is stored in digital form. So data might have been correct, collected manually. For example, through census exercise or through a government survey, data might have been recorded manually in a register, in a book. If this data is digitized and stored on computers, if it is stored on servers and processed through IT systems, then it becomes digital data. The data you're contributing to social media companies and all the internet based platforms, right? We are willingly sharing our data by using various applications. So all of this constitutes your personal data, which is stored in digital form. So data that is collected online, data collected offline, but which is digitized. All of this constitutes personal digital data. Is that clear? So that is the primary focus of this bill. It protects your personal digital data, data that is personal to the individual and data that is stored in digital format. Is that clear? So it does not cover non digitized data. It does not cover non digitized data. It also does not cover non personal data. what we also refer to as metadata, data related to a group of people in a given region from which you can't identify the person behind it, right? Where companies use the non-personal data to identify behaviors and patterns, right? Such data is not covered under the regulation of this law. Is that clear? I'll repeat the point. This bill essentially protects your data privacy and security and covers only your digital personal data. It does not cover non digitized data and does not cover non personal data. In fact, for non personal data, the government is coming out with a different set of regulation and it has even set up a committee to recommend the legal regulatory framework for non personal data. Now, please take this as a small exercise. Identify which is this committee that has been constituted by the government of India to provide recommendations regarding regulation of non personal data. It's headed by a very popular individual. So please identify the name of the committee and post that in the comments below. So now that you understood the purpose of the bill and you also understood the concept of digital personal data, let's dive deep into the topic. Let's look at the background to this law. Back in 2017, the Supreme Court of India passed a historic judgment in the KS Puttaswamy case and declared that right to privacy is a fundamental right which is integral to Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. The Supreme Court interpreted Article 21 that is right to life and it gave for a wider interpretation which provided for right to privacy being considered as a fundamental right. Parallelly, the government of India, which was also concerned about data protection and data privacy, established a committee under Justice B. N. Shri Krishna. The Ministry of Electronics and IT established the B. N. Shri Krishna committee to look into personal data and recommend a law to provide for data privacy and data protection in the country. So B and Shri Krishna committee went into the issue. It consulted all the stakeholders, including the government, the industry and the public, and finally came out with a set of recommendations that led to the personal data protection bill that was drafted by the government. 
this previous version of the bill was introduced in the parliament as well in 2019 but it immediately generated a lot of controversy because with regard to exemptions given to government agencies a number of government security and law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies they were given wide sweeping exemptions which raised fears that the government could misuse these exemptions to promote mass surveillance and targeted surveillance while only placing restrictions on private companies and, and other entities that are dealing with data. So based on this criticism, there was very strong opposition against the previous bill and hence the bill was pushed for a further review by a joint parliamentary committee. The parliamentary committee suggested several amendments and hence the government decided to withdraw the bill last year. The previous bill was withdrawn from the parliament. So the Ministry of Electronics and IT started work on a new bill and the draft version of the bill was placed in the public domain in December 2022. Now the bill has been finalized, approved by the cabinet and it has been tabled in the Lok Sabha. It's in this context that it becomes very, very important to look at some of the key provisions that have been included in the new bill. First, you should understand the concept of data principle and data fiduciary because any data protection law defines these two entities. These are the primary entities when it comes to data protection. It includes data principles on one side and data fiduciaries on the other side. Let me explain who are data principles, who are data fiduciaries and based on that we can take a look at the provisions. Data principles are none other than the users the citizens of the country, the ones who are contributing the data. As far as data protection is concerned, global consensus is that the users, they should be considered as the principal owners of the data. As we users and citizens are generating the data and contributing our data to social media companies, government agencies, etc. It's important to recognize the user or the citizen as the owner of that data. So that's why they are called data principles. They are the primary entity over here. Usually, any data protection law gives a set of rights to data principles because it is their data which has to be protected. It is the data privacy and data security of data principles which has to be protected by the law. So that is why a set of rights are accorded to the data principles through this law. Is that clear? Whereas data fiduciaries on the other hand, they are the intermediaries. They are the ones who come in between, who collect your data, who store the data, who process and handle and transfer the data. All these entities, it could be private institutions, private companies or government institutions or government agencies. They all fall under the definition of data fiduciaries. Could be private or could be government institutions. So be it your internet service providers, a hospital, a school or a college or a social media firm, right? The tech companies, government ministries, departments and agencies, they all fall under the definition of data fiduciary because they are the ones collecting your data, processing, storing, handling and transferring your data. Is that clear? So the law defines who are data principles, who are data fiduciaries and ideally data fiduciaries are placed under few obligations. And by fulfilling these obligations, data fiduciaries have to uphold the rights that have been given to data principles. This is what any data protection law would do. Is that clear? Data principles are given a set of rights to protect their data and ensure their data privacy. It's the duty of data fiduciaries to uphold their obligations so that the rights of data principles can be protected. This is the very essence of any data protection regime. Now, let's see what the bill introduced by the government says. The bill says that it applies for processing of digital personal data within India where the data is collected online or collected offline and then digitized and it also applies to processing of personal data outside of India 
if the services and goods are being offered within the jurisdiction of India. So it means whatever data is generated by Indian citizens, by Indian users is covered under the law. Whether the data is collected online or if it's collected offline and then digitized, all such data will be covered under the law. It covers digital data and personal data. So data that is collected within the country and even the data which is being transferred and handled abroad, if it is related to services and goods being offered in India, all of this data comes under the ambit of this law. Personal data is defined as any data about an individual who is identifiable by using that data. As I told you, by looking at this data set, if you can identify the living person behind it who generated the data, if you can pinpoint who is the data principal behind the data, then that such data is called personal data. So data fiduciaries have this obligation. They have the responsibility when collecting the data, storing it, using it, sharing it with others. They have the responsibility to protect the user's data. Now, one of the most important rights which is accorded to data principles is the right to consent. Please make a note of this. It's a very, very important point. The law recognizes the right to consent for data principles, which means that data fiduciaries cannot collect your data without your explicit consent. Before collecting data from you, right, they have to obtain the explicit consent by informing the individual as to why they are collecting the data, for what purpose and how it will be used. This has to be clearly specified to the data principle and only with the user's consent data can be collected, processed and shared. Is that clear? But there is an exemption as well. There are certain instances where data can be collected even without your consent. The government says that for legitimate uses where consent is not seen to be necessary, in such cases, the data fiduciaries can collect the data without your explicit consent. For example, on the grounds of medical emergency, with regard to your employment, then for availing any benefits or services from the government, right? So on these grounds and as well as on national security grounds, data can be collected even without your consent. Is that clear? In case of minors, those who are below 18 years of age, consent will be provided by their parent or legal guardian. So apart from these specific cases, data cannot be collected from a user without their explicit consent. Is that clear? Now let's say you want to avail government services. Now you can't tell the government that your consent has to be obtained all the time to, to ensure that government services are delivered to you. Like for example, let's say you are receiving pensions or scholarship or you're, you're paying taxes, right? Or you're eligible for some incentive or, from, or some subsidy from the government, right? You can't expect the government to take your consent all the time to deliver governance and to provide government public services. Government has the right to collect such data on legitimate grounds, including national security grounds. So some of these areas are exempted and right to consent will not apply in these cases. But otherwise, the fiduciary has to obtain your consent before collecting your data. That's a key provision. Next, this law is not only providing a set of rights to data principles, it is also placing duties and obligations on data principles. This is where criticism has come in. Now, if you look at European Union's GDPR, the General Data Protection Regime, which is seen as a model law, it does not place any duties or obligations on data principles. Data principles are supposed to be given rights. But in the Indian context, the law which has been proposed is placing duties and obligations as well. The law is saying that the principals will have the right to obtain any information about processing of data. That is, you'll have the right to ask your fiduciary. You can ask your social media companies, your internet service providers and few government agencies as well as to how your data is being processed. You can seek any correction of your data. If there are any wrong entries which have been made 
or you want to change some entries, you should have the right to correct the data. So for that, the option should be available. And even the right to be forgotten, the right to be completely forgotten, the right to erase the data. Now tomorrow, let's say you want to delete your Instagram account, you want to delete your WhatsApp account. You need a guarantee from the company that the company is not retaining any data on you, even after you delete the account. Is that clear? So you have a right to ask erasure of your personal data, a complete deletion of your personal data when you quit the service so that you are completely forgotten by the fiduciary so that your privacy is completely protected. These are some basic rights which have been guaranteed. You can even nominate another person to exercise your rights in the event of death because even after you pass away, right, your data still remains online it, and it still could be potentially misused. So to prevent such misuse, you can nominate someone else on your behalf who can exercise your rights as the data principal. And it also provides the right to grievance redressal. You can raise complaints, you can raise your grievances with the data fiduciaries. These are some basic rights that have been guaranteed and this has been appreciated by the general public and by experts as well. But however, the concern, the criticism is about the duties and obligations which are being placed on data principles. Is that clear? You might be penalized and punished if you file false grievances and false complaints. It includes a fine of up to 10,000 rupees. Now this might seem to be legitimate, but the concern here is that if there is the penal element, if there is penalty involved, that to a fine involved, the data principles might become hesitant to even raise their grievance or complaint because they will always have a fear. What if tomorrow the complaint is described as false or frivolous by the authorities? Then they might be punished and levied a fine of 10,000 rupees. So it becomes a deterrent. It will deter the users from raising their grievances and complaints. This is where strong criticism has come in against the law. Now, if you look at data fiduciaries, the intermediaries, they are obligated to clearly state the purpose of data collection, why they are collecting the data. This has to be clearly specified by them. They have to ensure that they take all the efforts necessary to ensure accuracy and completeness of data. Right? In the data which has been collected, it should be accurate and complete. And this is the duty of the fiduciary. They have to build safeguards to prevent a data breach. They have to implement the best data protection standards and cyber security standards to prevent any kind of unauthorized access to personal data or else they will be held liable for it. The bill also proposes a data protection board of India as a grievance redressal and dispute resolution mechanism. The grievances raised by the data principles and any disputes that will come up involving data fiduciaries will be adjudicated by the data protection board. Is that clear? So data protection board of India is being set up. This board will comprise of a chairperson and members who are appointed by the government of India. Is that clear? The government has the powers to appoint the chairperson and the members to the board. But however, to ensure their independence, they have been given some degree of protection with regard to their salary, with regard to their remuneration and uh, tenure of service and their terms of service right that can't be changed to their disadvantage after their appointment once they are appointed their sal salary cannot be reduced their remuneration cannot be taken away the terms of service and condition cannot be altered by the government after their appointment this guarantees the independence of the chairperson and the members and thus allows them to function freely without any pressure from the government is that clear so some degree of protection has been given but it's not a regulatory body Please remember that it's not a regulatory body. It's only been given adjudicatory powers. It can only adjudicate on the grievances, disputes and complaints that are filed by the data principles and data fiduciaries. So it's an adjud adjudicatory body. Now, let me show you some specific provisions where concerns have been expressed and where praise also has come up for the government. Let's see what the law exactly protects. As I told you, the bill is introducing duties and penalties on data principles 
this is where criticism has come in this is where there is concern that it will create a deterrent and it will prevent users from filing the complaints then if you look at chapter 3 clause 11 you don't have to remember this but just for specific uh, points I've raised this but you don't have to remember the exact clause that's not needed but remember the key point here clause 11 of chapter 3 says that data principal has the right to request from data fiduciary a summary of the personal data which is being processed now after you have contributed your personal data you can demand the data fiduciary to give you a summary regarding how your data is being processed you can also demand the identity of other fiduciaries with whom your personal data is being shared now for example a social media firm like let's say facebook meta right or instagram or whatsapp or or twitter they might share your data with other entities right they might monetize your data with your consent but you should be informed about it you should know the other third parties the other data fiduciaries with whom your personal data has been shared and how they are using it you should have complete awareness on how your personal data is being utilized so that is the obligation on data fiduciaries this point has been much appreciated you have the right to request a summary of the processing of your data and you can demand the data fiduciaries to inform you regarding the identity identities of other fiduciaries with whom they are sharing your personal data clause 12 says that you can seek correction and updation and even erasure of your data it means you have a right you have a right to correct your data you also have a right to be forgotten once you end their service as I told you if you quit a certain platform if you're no longer using their services you should have the option to demand the fiduciary to completely erase and delete all the personal data that they have on you they should also give you an option to correct and update your data as and when necessary so the right to be forgotten and the right to correct is being provided and the provision which previously allowed a fiduciary to reject these requests has been removed under the previous law the previous version of the bill data fiduciary could have rejected these requests on certain grounds but this has been removed and as a result it has been appreciated by experts it favors the data users the data principles is that clear next under clause 13 you are being given a right to grievance redressal and right to nominate another individual in the case of death under clause 14 these are the basic rights that are being accorded to data principles but the real concern is about the obligations the duties which are being imposed the two with penalties in other democratic countries you don't see this happening as I told you if you look at European Union's GDPR data principles are not placed under any obligations they don't have any duties to fulfill and they are not penalized but here in the Indian context the law is looking to penalize the data principles if your complaints and grievances are found to be frivolous or false now the point is who will determine whether your complaint or grievance is false of course the data protection board the point is whether the board can be unbiased can it be truly neutral and the real concern is that this will become a deterrent the penalty of 10,000 and the option of being penalized will scare people away people will not be motivated to raise grievances and complaints if there is a penal provision involved so this is a drawback and a major point of criticism against the bill next let's look at the exemptions this is another area of concern few fiduciaries some of the data fiduciaries they are granted few exemptions they don't have to follow these obligations this mainly applies for government entities few select government entities on certain grounds they are exempted from the provisions of the law especially on the grounds of national security on the grounds of public order is that clear and also with regard to processing of data by government entities in the interest of security of the nation and data which is being used for research 
data which has been archived, which has been stored already for archival purposes and statistical purposes like census data, data of the National Family Health Survey. So such data which is used for statistics, which has been archived, which is used for research, that data can be exempted by the government. And data collected for national security law and order can also be exempted, which means all security agencies, law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies, they will get an exemption on certain grounds. Now, while such an exemption is needed on security grounds, the fear is that if there are no checks and balances, these powers can be easily misused. The fear is that the ruling party at the center might misuse the intelligence agencies or law enforcement agencies to carry out targeted surveillance and mass surveillance against few people. The government might target opposition leaders, journalists, social activists, student leaders, etc., who are critical of the government and breach their data privacy in the name of national security. How do you strike that balance? So the law is not clear on this. It is giving blanket exemptions again on the grounds of security and law and order and several government entities will be exempted. Is that clear? So there is always a fear of this power being misused by government officials and by the members of the ruling party which cripples dissent and criticism and that could weaken the very foundation of the democracy. So this is where a major concern has been expressed. Is that clear? There are five specific grounds where exemptions have been provided to government authorities and in fact compared to previous bill it has actually provided for a wider exemption. This is the real concern. It has even included data for research, data which has been archived and data for statistical purposes. Even this can be exempted. So this concern has been raised by experts and they fear that this could lead to breach of data privacy and it could even affect your right to free speech and expression if it is misused by the government and the authorities. So this is where a lot of concern and criticism has been raised. Next, the other big concern, the bill seeks to amend the IT Act and RTI Act. Both the points are very, very controversial. This will definitely be opposed by the opposition parties in the parliament. The bill, the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill, seeks to amend a certain provision of the IT Act, the Information Technology Act, and as well as the RTI Act, the Right to Information Act. These proposed amendments to these laws have raised a lot of concern because under Section 43A of the IT Act, previously, data fiduciaries were obliged to pay damages to the victims if their data was not handled properly. Now, let's say there is a social media company. If it has not implemented the right data protection standards and cyber security standards, and if there is a breach of your data, and if your data privacy has been compromised, then you could have sought compensation from this company. The data principles had the right to seek compensation because the IT Act provided for the companies to provide an award or provide for damages suffered by the victims in case of a data breach. If there is negligence on the part of the company in protecting your data, the company was obliged to pay for the damages. This key provision is being removed entirely. Through the Digital Data Protection Bill, the Personal Data Protection Bill, this section of IT Act is being removed. It will exclude this provision, which means you as an individual cannot seek compensation from the company, even if they are negligent, even if because of their negligence, your data has been compromised. Even then you will not get any compensation because this provision is being deleted through this proposed amendment to the, to, to the IT Act. So naturally, this provision has been heavily criticized by experts. The other big concern a very, very big concern is the proposed amendment to the RTI Act, the Right to Information Act. As you know, RTI has revolutionized good governance in the country. It has brought in transparency and accountability. People can access government information, ask for critical information and thus ensure that there's a check on corruption 
and ensure efficient governance. So in this regard, the public information officers, right, they have certain grounds on which they can deny information to you. Information which is linked with national security, information which is not supposed to be in public domain, right, information directly connected to a parliamentary discussion or cabinet notes. Such information can be denied by public information officers. They need not share that under RTI Act. Now the problem is that through the Personal Digital Data Protection Bill, Clause 44.3 is seeking to amend Section 8.1 Clause 1 Sub Clause J of RTI Act. Essentially, through this amendment, public information officers can say that the information that you are seeking is related to personal information of some officer, of some minister. Since it is personal data, this will become a new ground for denying your right to information. Is that clear? Now let's say you suspect corruption in a government body. Now you have filed a RTA application. The public information officer of that concerned government department, he might say that the information you are asking is linked to the personal data of the government officials. It's their personal data and it's protected under data protection law. So we are not going to share the data. You might have sought the salary details of a government official to check and match his assets and liabilities to see whether he has been corrupt, which is a valid ground for seeking information under RTI Act. But public information officers will get a new ground through this amendment. Since the data is directly connected to the officer and his personal life, they can say that this is personal information protected under data protection law and they can deny you your right to information. Essentially, it undermines the RTI Act. Tomorrow, if you are seeking critical information to unravel corruption, to improve governance, to ensure checks on the government, the PIOs can deny that information by simply linking it with personal data of government officers and ministers. This has raised a lot of concern amongst activists. Is that clear? So essentially, the bill does have some good provisions, right? It has been widely appreciated for certain provisions, but it also has many drawbacks. One of the widely appreciated provision is that the data fiduciaries are obligated to inform the data principles when there is a data breach. This wasn't there before. Now, if there is a data breach which has happened, Right? Data fiduciaries have an obligation, a legal obligation to inform the data principles of the breach so that you are aware of the data breach. This is widely appreciated. But the obligations, the obligations on data fiduciaries have been widened. And this is even good news as well for data principles. Because now data fiduciaries, they have to inform you on how your data is being collected and processed how your data is being shared, how you can withdraw your consent, how you can raise grievances. All of this will have to be provided by data fiduciaries. It empowers the data principles. These are all good provisions which are being very widely appreciated. But there are serious concerns about the penal provisions, concerns about the amendments to IT Act and RTI Act and the wide exemptions given to government agencies. Right? So let's see how the bill goes forward in the parliament. Let's look at the opposition, what they will have to say. And please keep track of this development. It's a very, very important topic. Right? So with this, we complete the first big article. And now let's take up the next article from page 14. This article is examining the Rohini Committee on Subcategorization of OBCs. This committee was set up in 2017, in October 2017. The Justice G. Rohini Commission had been set up to provide for subcategorization of other backward classes. I hope you know that OBCs are given 27% reservation following the Mandal era. The Mandal Commission in the late 1980s recommended that 27% reservation has to be provided to other backward classes as well. Just like how reservation is given to SCs and STs. Similarly, reservation was recommended for other backward classes. And this would apply in government jobs, in education, and also with regard to 
enjoying certain government privileges. The main purpose was to uplift, socially uplift the backward classes of the country. Essentially the castes which have suffered because of caste based discrimination, they were supposed to be socially uplifted. But of course the introduction of this reservation was highly controversial. It led to massive protests, it involved the in, uh, intervention of the Supreme Court as well in the Indra Savani judgment where Supreme Court placed a cap on reservation, a maximum cap of 50% on reservation. So 27% reservation for OBCs was implemented and now it's almost 30 years since its implementation. One of the biggest criticisms against the reservation policy is that only few castes, few dominant caste groups, only they have benefited from this reservation. This has always been a criticism against the policy of affirmative action. Many committees, experts, they have always pointed out that few castes and within caste there are sub caste groups. They are politically dominant in certain states. Like for example in Gujarat you have few communities which are dominant. In Punjab, in Haryana, right? There are few caste groups which are very very dominant socially and politically compared to other caste groups. In Karnataka as well. Right? In every state, there are few castes and sub-caste groups which are more dominant socially and politically. So they have largely cornered the benefits of reservation. Reservation in government jobs, in education and access to other government privileges have largely been cornered and monopolized by some of these caste groups, thereby leaving behind the other caste groups. So to address this concern, the committee, the Rohini Commission had been set up to look at the implementation of OBC reservation and to recommend subcategorization of caste groups. So if caste groups can be subcategorized within OBC, if the caste groups can be organized, right, then the ones which, which are really underprivileged, the ones which are really backward, they can be given greater benefits of reservation while excluding the well-to-do caste groups within the OBC category. That was the primary purpose of this committee. So after six years and multiple extensions, the committee has recently submitted the report to the President of India. Is that clear? On July 31st, just a few days back, this commission has submitted the report to the President of India on subcategorizing more than 2,600 caste groups in the central OBC list. This was the mandate given to the commission. Is that clear? The primary purpose was to examine how much of the 27% reservation has been exploited by few dominant OBC groups and which are these caste groups which have benefited and monopolized the reservation policy, which are the groups that have been truly left behind, which are the small groups that have dominated OBC reservation, which have cornered all the benefits because of their social political dominance and which are the groups that have been left behind. So proper data was needed for this to subcategorize the OBC groups. So that is why this commission had been set up and the report has been submitted. Now let's see what the commission has said. The commission explored the ways of subcategorizing the OBC groups and it concluded that benefits have not been distributed equitably. It's a validation of the concern that experts had expressed for many decades. Right? Many experts had argued that under OBC reservation only few caste groups are benefiting. Only the dominant caste groups in each state, they are benefiting whereas others are being left behind. So this has again been reiterated by the Rohini Commission and it has worked out a formula to provide for equitable distribution of OBC reservation. Essentially it has identified those groups which have historically benefited, which have received the highest share of this reservation. So going forward, the recommendation is that these groups have to be given lesser reservation, whereas the ones who have received less priority, they should be given a higher percentage of the reservation. That is within the OBC category of 27% reservation, subcategorization will help in identifying the caste groups that have been left behind, which are still backward. And it will help in identifying the dominant caste groups which have cornered all the benefits. So accordingly, the reservation 
the reservation percentage can be equitably distributed. Within OBC category, there can be a redistribution of the percentage of reservation to ensure fairness for various caste groups. This is the recommendation given by the Rohini Commission. Now this finding is extremely important. It has great significance as far as India's socio-economic development and as well as electoral politics are concerned. Because this is a reiteration and a validation of the fact that reservation policy, if it is not implemented properly, it may not benefit the intended target group. As I told you, there are many examples in different parts of the country where only few dominant caste groups have benefited mainly because of their dominant political status. So this report might pave the way for a caste census which has been a long-standing demand of several opposition parties and caste groups. Several caste groups and political groups are demanding a socio-economic caste census to figure out the extent of backwardness of various caste groups in the country. Now any such census and any debate on OBC reservation will have electoral consequences because several parties have made this a vote bank to win elections by favoring the dominant caste groups. Is that clear? There are several national parties, regional parties which have made this their business by working with the dominant caste groups by favoring them, by allowing them to enjoy the benefits inequitably to the disadvantage of other smaller groups, they have managed to win votes. They managed to create a vote bank out of these caste groups, thus ensuring their victory in elections. Is that clear? So this debate is very controversial as well. And that's why the government of India as of now is unlikely to accept these recommendations. Right? Recommendations are not binding. Any committee's recommendations, they are not binding on the government. So government has said we will further hold discussions with all stakeholders and we will see what can be implemented, what cannot be implemented. But the findings of the commission is important just because of the fact it has validated the known conclusion that reservation has not benefited all the groups equitably. Right? Especially OBC reservation has benefited only few groups which are dominant already, which are close to political parties, which are large in number because they are a vote bank for political parties. Many other groups are left behind. That's why the Rohini Commission has given a formula to redistribute this reservation equitably between these different caste groups. Is that clear? So this is what we should understand from this important article. The Rohini Commission also has performed one more task. It has tried to give a clean structure to the listing and the naming of the caste groups. Because in India there are so many castes Right? Where the spelling is different, the name of the caste groups are different, leading to confusion from state to state. So, Rohini Commission has tried to streamline that process by streamlining the naming process of different caste groups. And that is also one task which has been completed by the Rohini Commission. Now, coming to the next article. This article on page 13 focuses on tuberculosis, on India's fight against TB. As you know, tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria. It's a highly infectious communicable disease and one of the biggest epidemic burdens in the world. Before COVID-19, TB was considered as one of the biggest threat as far as contagious diseases were concerned. So WHO and governments around the world have paid a lot of attention to tackle tuberculosis. Because every year there are millions of TB cases that come up in the, in the world. There are millions of cases with millions of deaths being reported as well. And especially the disease burden is high on developing and underdeveloped countries. So this has always been a concern for the WHO and also to the United Nations. So that is why under sustainable development goals, under the SDG targets, under 3.3, that is goal number 3, target number 3, which focuses on communicable diseases, the goal is to end epidemics such as AIDS, TB, malaria and other tropical diseases which are placing a higher burden on developing, underdeveloped and poor countries. Is that clear? Under the sustainable development goals of the UN, there is a dedicated focus to eliminate communicable diseases under goal number 3, target number 3, that is 3.3, SDG 3.3. 
so tuberculosis is covered under this goal and the vision of the UN and WHO is to achieve this target by the end of the decade that is by 2030 so if you look at India India faces a very high disease burden as far as tuberculosis is concerned as India is a developing nation right India does face one of the world's highest disease burden as far as tuberculosis is concerned so we had a program called RNTCP to combat tuberculosis in the country this program was renamed and upgraded in 2020 and now it's known as the national TB elimination program the government has set a very ambitious goal for itself to eliminate tuberculosis by 2025 is that clear? The goal of the Indian government is to eliminate tuberculosis five years before the global target. Global target to eliminate TB is 2030 under sustainable development goals. India wants to achieve this target in another two years by 2025. But however, there is one problem. There is one roadblock. That's what the article is focusing upon. The article is mainly focused on testing and diagnosis. Because see, to fight any contagious communicable disease, testing or diagnosis is extremely critical. We all learned this lesson during the COVID-19 pandemic. You need efficient, simple and accurate testing methods. Right? That is how you pick out the cases, you isolate the patients, give them the right treatment and ensure that others don't contract the disease. If testing and diagnosis is not effective, if, if it's not accurate, then your fight against the disease will never succeed. So, in tackling TB, this has been a major problem. There are two types of testing as far as tuberculosis is concerned. One type of testing is smear microscopy, where a smear sample is taken of the phlegm because TB is essentially a pulmonary respiratory disease, right? The phlegm which is generated, it is collected, the sample is smeared onto a cotton swab and this is put under a microscopic test. This has been a traditional way of testing and diagnosing tuberculosis. But the problem is, smear microscopy is not very accurate. Is that clear? And more importantly, it does not recognize, it cannot identify rifampicin resistance, which is responsible for multi-drug resistant TB. Today, the biggest concern, as we discussed in a recent class, is the rise of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and extensive drug resistant tuberculosis. So, re reform piscin resistance is not identified under smear microscopy test. This is entirely missed. So, patients will be given the wrong line of medication which will not help them cure. It will in fact contribute to the rise of drug resistance. The better way of testing and diagnosing tuberculosis is by using molecular testing. This is what WHO also has recommended. Even WHO guidelines recommends a molecular test which is many times more efficient and accurate compared to smear microscopy. Molecular test will identify, it can identify rifampicin resistance in the initial stage of the diagnosis itself thereby giving better insight to the treating doctors and they can put the patient on the right course of treatment in order to overcome drug resistance and ensure that the patient recovers quickly. Is that clear? But WHO data is showing that across the world, majority of the testing and diagnosis is still happening through smear microscopy. This is the roadblock in India as well. Is that clear? Molecular testing has not increased as envisioned. According to the World Global TB Report, the WHO's Global TB Report, 40% of people are not even diagnosed. They don't even take up testing. These numbers are very high in India. It's even higher in India at 64%. According to the National TB Surveillance Survey Report, 64% of TB patients in the country, they don't even get tested. Whereas it's 40% at the global level and the others who are getting tested, most of them are still using smear microscopy, which is not accurate, which cannot identify rifampicin resistance. 
So the adoption of molecular testing is lagging behind and this is affecting testing and diagnosis and this could derail India from achieving its goal by 2025. Is that clear? That is what the article is highlighting. The National Strategic Plan for TB Elimination has noted that smear microscopy test should have reduced but it hasn't. Even though my molecular tests have increased, smear microscopy tests have still remained very high which points to inaccurate testing and diagnosis thereby weakening our fight against the disease. Is that clear? So there are two problems to India's goal. One is no, the lack of diagnosis. There is no diagnosis at all. 64% of the patients in India, they don't even get tested. Alright, this is a global problem as well. 40% of the people in the world are not getting tested. The second problem is the increased prevalence of smear microscopy testing as compared to molecular testing. Alright, these are the two hurdles for India to achieve the goal by 2025. So please make a note of these points. It's very, very important for your mains and even for your prelims examination. So this completes my detailed discussion of these columns, which are very relevant for the mains exam, even for your essay papers. So now let's proceed to the last part of today's discussion and look at the prelims section. We have some very, very interesting articles today. So please pay attention. Ensure that you cover all the key factual points I'll be discussing in the next 10 to 15 minutes. We have this article on page number one that refers to clouded leopards. Clouded leopards are found in Asia in particular. There are two subspecies of clouded leopards. You can see them in the images that I have added over here. You have the mainland clouded leopard, the mainland clouded leopard, which is distributed across India, that is the Himalayan belt, the northeast region of India, even Nepal, parts of Bhutan and Southeast Asia going all the way till Malaysia. So you'll find the clouded leopard at the foothills of Himalayas, particularly in the northeast region of India, in Nepal, Bhutan and other parts of Southeast Asia, in Myanmar, in Thailand, in Malaysia, etc. So this category of clouded leopard is categorized as vulnerable on the IUCN red list. So it's a threatened species. It's facing a risk of extinction. All right. The other subspecies, the Sunda clouded leopard, this is endemic, meaning it is native. It is found only in Borneo and Sumatra of Indonesia, Malaysia and Brunei. It's only in this region that you find the Sunda clouded leopard which is also categorized as vulnerable on the IUCN red list. Is that clear? The Sunda clouded leopard is endemic to Borneo forests that is shared between Indonesia, Malaysia and Brunei and also found on the Sumatran island of Indonesia. This is where you find this subspecies. Both are categorized as vulnerable. They face the risk of habitat destruction, hunting, poaching, etc. Now, according to the article, researchers from India from the Wildlife Institute of India, they have found that clouded leopards don't have a specific pattern to their hunting and to their activities. Generally, at animals in general, they have a certain behavioral pattern according to which they behave, right? They hide in certain parts of the forest, the way they walk, the way they hunt, right? Every animal has a certain pattern which makes them more predictable. But clouded leopard has a stealth feature. That's why they are called ninjas of the forest because they are quite incredible hunters. They are very efficient and ferocious hunters. And research has shown that they are unpredictable in their behavior. They don't have set patterns. They have no specific pattern of how they operate in the forest areas. Is that clear? This is what makes them unique. It sets them apart. They are also known as... They are also likened to the saber tooth of the ice age. They're also referred to as the modern saber tooth because of the long saber like teeth that they have. And one unique feature of the clouded leopard is that they can climb down a tree by facing downwards. Other big cats cannot do that. Now, let's say a cheetah, right? Cheetahs, leopards can climb trees. When they climb the tree, they go up and when they come back, 
they have to come back keeping their head above they can't reverse and put the head down first and come back because of the ankle position but clouded leopards they have a rotating rear ankle the ankle in their hind leg can be rotated it can turn back and this allows the animal to climb down head first from the trees unlike any other big cat this is a unique feature of the clouded leopard so please note down these key points very very important for your prelims it is found in india in the northeast region at the foothills of himalayas is that clear and it is a threatened species because it is listed as vulnerable on the iucn red list next on page number 8 we have an article that refers to the kutti kanam palace that you can see here in the image the kutti kanam palace is in kerala in the idukki district you might know the popular hill station that is the thekdi in idukki district that is where you find this 130 year old palace this this was the summer palace of the royals of the travancore kingdom all right the travancore kings had built this as a summer palace as the temperatures are lower in the hill station around thekdi and in the idukki district they would shift over here and continue administration from here so please note down some basic facts about the palace it can be a important history uh, fact the palace was built in the year 1890 during the reign of moolam tirunal ramavarma the then king of the travancore kingdom who ruled the princely state from 1885 to 1994 or uh, 1924 The construction of the palace was supervised by J D Munro the popular british planter he visited the site multiple times during its construction is that clear so this was the home of the royals of the travancore kingdom and it is also believed to have a secret tunnel that connects the palace with the piramade shri krishna swami temple that is present nearby in the idukki district now the kerala government wants to declare this as a protected monument because of its historical significance it wants to declare it as a protected monument for further conservation so please note down the basic facts you never know it might help you in a prelims question next on page number 9 we have a very very important development which has been reported national security advisers of several countries are meeting at jeddah which is in saudi arabia to discuss the future of ukraine and how to bring the war to an end through a peaceful diplomatic resolution it's the initiative of saudi arabia saudi arabia's crown prince mohammed bin salman has taken this initiative to host the nsa conference on ukraine so the national security advisers and several top officials of various countries have been invited the nsa of us nsa of several european countries and top officials from saudi arabia uae and even from china and from india have all been invited including officials from ukraine however russia has been completely excluded is that clear russian government has not been invited but ukraine and other concerned countries especially some global south countries like india brazil south africa mexico right which have largely been neutral in the conflict they have been invited and the focus is to work out a resolution to provide for humanitarian assistance to ukraine and also provide a diplomatic solution to bring the war to an end so from india national security advisor ajit doval will be participating he has already landed at jeddah which is in saudi arabia so please remember this it's a saudi initiative to organize this nsa conference on ukraine by bringing the national security advisers of various key powers together to discuss a possible solution india is very eager to participate in this conference not just to find a solution to end the war but this might also give us a platform to bring consensus before the g20 summit next month because right now at g20 which india is presiding there is a division right western countries have been divided on one side russia china on the other side so india has been struggling to drive a consensus between g20 members and this could be a platform for us to bring them together and work out a settlement so that we can have a final statement in in the g20 summit that will happen in september is that clear 
So at the NSA conference, Global South Cooperation is the focus. India, Brazil, South Africa, Mexico and others will be urged by US, Saudi Arabia and even the European countries to work together with Ukraine and help work out a solution to end this war. But of course, Russia is not part of it, but it might give more support to Ukraine's plan, the peace plan that had been promoted by Ukrainian President Zelensky. He had called for a complete withdrawal of Russian troops. And along with that, he had suggested few other measures. So this might be discussed, but without Russia's participation, of course, it will not have any value as such. But at least it will bring some pressure on Russia to try and work out a diplomatic solution to the conflict. All right. So please look forward to the developments of the Jeddah NSA conference where India is also participating. Because this comes a few months after India held a quadrilateral meeting, a similar meeting with USA, UAE and Saudi Arabia. Just three months ago at Jeddah itself, India's NSA Ajit Doval met with NSAs of US, UAE and Saudi Arabia and they discussed connectivity projects in West Asia. That's where the idea of a connectivity project from Israel to Saudi Arabia to India was proposed. So this has a lot of potential. It brings India closer to West Asian countries where US is also working together with India to drive common interests. Is that clear? So that is a key development that's reported on page 9. Next, according to this article on page 11, organ donation in India is not up to mark. There is a critical shortage of organ availability, which is affecting lakhs of patients. As you know, patients suffer from various disorders and organ failures, like kidney failure or liver failure, etc. Right? And the only way out for those patients is to receive a organ transplant. But for that, you need organ donors to provide or donate organs. Right? So in the demand supply market here, in the organ market, there is a huge mismatch, a demand supply mismatch. Very few donors are willingly donating when they are alive. Right? So the focus should be to push up donation after death has occurred, after accidental deaths happen. From the cadaver, that is from the dead body, the organs can be harvested if permissions are given on time. If the family members are aware, if the doctors are aware, they can work together, get the right permissions to harvest those essential organs, which can save someone else's life. Now imagine a very healthy person has suffered an unfortunate accident and lost their life. The organs might still be good, but if the family is aware and if the doctors in the ICU are aware, they can get the permission and they can harvest the organs and save someone else's life who is waiting for organ transplant. In India, the list of people waiting for organ transplant has crossed 3 lakh. There are more than 3 lakh patients in the country waiting for organ transplant. But organ donation is minimal. It is single digits on a day-to-day -day basis. Right? Look at this table here. It shows data from the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare regarding organ donations in the country. Only around 16,000 donations have been recorded last year in 2022, which is very, very less compared to the demand that we have. All right, the donation rate, organ donation rate is under one donor per million population, which is very, very low. That is for 10 lakh people, there is less than one donor donating organs. The expected standard should be at least 65 donations per million. If you have to meet the demand in India of 3 lakh patients, you need at least 65 donors per 1 million population. But in India, it's less than one. The problem is very serious, right? This is a global problem as well. Even in other countries, the number of donors per million is very less, maybe in the range of 20 to 30. But in India, it's very horrible. It's less than one. Very few people who are aware, they write a will and they donate their organs that they will list out what should happen to their organs after they die. They are called living donors who would have donated organs while they are still alive. That is after their death, after they pass away, they would have clearly instructed the family members, the doctors as to what to do with their organs. But the real challenge is to bring organs from cadavers in case of accidental deaths, where the person may not have written a will, they may not have exercised the option of donation. This is where the government, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has to promote awareness amongst families, amongst doctors, 
as to what to do after accidental deaths. Especially at the ICU level, you have a very narrow window. A few hours is available to quickly harvest the good organs from the cadaver after the passing of the person. Right? Even if the person has not donated, at least family members can step in. They can work with the doctors to donate the organs and thus save lives of other patients who are waiting for an organ transplant. So please pay attention to the topic. It's very, very relevant and important for both prelims and mains. Next article, Sahitya Academy is in news. As part of the G20 summit India is hosting, Sahitya Academy is bringing the literature of G20 countries together. All right, it is collecting popular poems from all the G20 countries and bringing it out as a collection of poems known as Under the Same Sky. This project is being led by noted poet Ranjit Hoskote. Ranjit Hoskote, a popular Indian poet, is leading this initiative with the Sahitya Academy where five poems from all G20 members is being collected and curated into a single collective work called Under the Same Sky. This will be released as part of the G20 summit. Alright, so please remember that point. Then few facts about Sahitya Academy. It comes under Ministry of Culture. Its main mandate is to promote literature, promote written work in the country. It has instituted the annual Sahitya Academy Awards. The institution was founded in 1954 and acts as the promoter of Indian literature and Indian languages. It's basically the National Academy of Letters for India. Is that clear? So it promotes Sahitya or literature in all the Indian languages. That is the primary objective of Sahitya Academy. It also brings out bi-monthly journals called Indian Literature in English and Samkalin Bharatiya Sahitya in Hindi. Please remember this. It might be relevant even for your state PCS exams. Next, on page number 12, the article refers to the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization, ACTO, which is a regional organization of Latin America. This organization is in news because Brazilian President Lula da Silva, you can see him in the image, he was newly elected to power recently. He has urged the Amazon Basin countries to come together and revive this group, revive the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization to focus on conservation and protection of the Amazonian forests. Is that clear? Because the Amazon basin is critical. It's a very important carbon sink to tackle climate change and to remove excess carbon from the atmosphere. Recently, Brazil suffered extensive damage to the Amazonian forest under the previous leader, Jair Bolsonaro, who was a far right-wing leader who believed in economic over-exploitation and he dismissed climate change as a conspiracy theory. He allowed private companies and contractors to burn down Amazonian forests by setting deliberate forest fires. So the policy of the previous Brazilian government was heavily criticized under Jair, Jair Bolsonaro. And today the forest is declining. It's facing a lot of stress because of deforestation. And hence, Brazilian leader, the new leader, Lula da Silva, is taking the initiative to revive this old grouping called Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization. And the summit will be held very soon to bring South American countries together to focus on conservation and protection of the Amazonian forest. So this group becomes very, very important. All right. It is based on the treaty, the Amazon Cooperation Treaty that was signed in 1978. And the organization was established in 1995. Please remember the facts. All right. The treaty was signed in 1978. And in 1995, the organization was set up, which brings nine Latin American countries together. These are the Amazonian countries present in the Amazon basin. It includes Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Guyana, Peru, Suriname and Venezuela. These nine, sorry, these eight South American countries of the Amazon Basin work together under the Amazon Cooperation Treaty. And they use this platform created by the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization to focus on conservation efforts of the Amazon forest. This organization had last met in 2008-2009. This was the last meeting. After that, the group had been neglected. 
So it's been 14 years since the organization met again. But now, thanks to Brazilian leader Lula da Silva, this regional group is being revived. And please remember, it's one of the few regional groups in the world which is exclusively focused on environmental issues. Usually, regional groupings are focused on economic growth, free trade agreements, or security relations, etc. This is one of the rare intergovernmental regional groupings which is just focused on environment conservation. Is that clear? That's why the organization is very, very important. Next, the sea drones of Ukraine has again made news. I covered this topic just yesterday. We spoke about the Novorossiysk port in Russia, in the Black Sea, where Ukrainian sea drones carried out an attack against a Russian naval ship. Immediately after that, there has been a second attack. Ukrainian sea drones are becoming very popular and quite notorious in launching successful and effective attacks against Russian ships and submarines. And this brings our attention to the topic of drone boats or also called sea drones or unmanned sea vessels. See, we are all familiar with aerial drones. Aerial drones have been there for many years already, right? They are used for reconnaissance, intelligence gathering, surveillance, and even to launch targeted attacks. Aerial drones have already been de widely deployed in conflict from Afghanistan to Yemen to Syria, right? US especially. Even now in the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war, both sides have been using aerial drones. India itself has a lot of aerial drones used for intelligence gathering. Even we are procuring armed drones as well. Right? So there is nothing surprising about aerial drones. But sea drones is something that's a relatively new technology. Ukraine has pioneered drone boats and it has become one of the first countries to actually deploy them in conflict, in an ongoing war. These sea drones or basically drone boats, they are unmanned sea vessels. Just like an aerial drone, it's a remotely piloted vessel which contains an explosive and a camera which is attached to it. So a drone boat attached with cameras can collect intelligence. It can either move along the surface or under the surface of the water. Depending on how it is designed, it can behave like a small submarine, a remotely piloted submarine. It can dive completely underwater and move under the surface of the water. Or it can move along the surface of the water like a small boat. Is that clear? So these sea drones that Ukraine has deployed contains a camera like this. It has been provided with remote GPS based navigation so that it can be remotely piloted. Explosives are placed and there is a detonator in front. So by using these sea drones, Ukraine has inflicted quite extensive damage against Russian naval assets. It's the first time we are seeing in the real world where sea drones are being deployed in actual conflict. Many countries are already pioneering this technology, right? Even they can be used for maritime intelligence gathering and for targeted precision attacks against naval assets and naval bases. So that is something you should be familiar with. Next, in the science and technology page, there is a mention of a whale species that went extinct around 39 million years ago. Now, why are we talking about this? It's important because recently a study has confirmed that this species, which has been named as Perucetus colossus or P. colossus, this has been recognized as the biggest living organism to have lived on Earth. Previously, this title was held by the blue whale. Blue whale has always been considered as the biggest organism. Not just the biggest aquatic organism, but the biggest of all living organisms. Right? But now the fossil which was found in Peru, that's why it's named after Peru, the country of Peru. This fossil of this aquatic species was discovered in southern Peru. And further studies has confirmed it's at least 39 million years old. And the size, which has been estimated by looking at its skeletal mass, is said to be two to three times more than the blue whale. So this species, when it lived, right, 39 million years ago, it was at least three times larger than the blue whale. So this is a depiction of how the aquatic species looked like. And it has been named as 
Perisitis colossus and its estimate weight is around 340 tons. Alright, so this was reported in the popular scientific journal Nature. The topic has captured global headlines. That's why I feel it can be very relevant for your exams. Coming to the last article, under the same page, we have a mention of Indian Eagle Owl that you can see here in the image. The Indian Eagle Owl, it's also called the Bengal Eagle Owl, also known as the Rock Eagle Owl. All right. It's a horned owl species because it's a, it has a horn-like structure at the top of its head. If you see the image here, it has these tuft, tuft of hair, tuft of hair and feathers which gives it a horn-like appearance. That's why it's a very unique owl species. Experts believe that its horn-like appearance is to scare the predators, to keep the predators away because it gives it a threatening, menacing look. Alright, it's a defensive feature that the owl has developed where the tuft has developed like a horn which makes it appear to be more menacing. Now, these are nocturnal birds which are active during the night but the interesting point is that they are not dependent on the forest. So deforestation does not threaten them. Please remember this point because these owls, the Indian Eagle owls, they are mainly found in agricultural lands and scrub lands. They rely on rodents like rats, bandicoots and others. They consume the rats and rodents which are found very easily near agricultural fields and that way they help the farmers as well. Is that clear? Farmers benefit from these owls even though superstition says that they are, they are bad news across cultures right in Hindu culture in Greek culture across the world as well superstition a lot of superstition is associated and myth is associated with the owl particularly this species of owl previously it was linked with the Eurasian owl but now it has been recognized as a separate species of its own it had been clubbed with Eurasian eagle owl before but now taxonomically it has been recognized as a separate species of owl that is endemic to India you find this owl in the hilly rocky scrub forest of the Indian subcontinent but the key point here is they are not dependent much on forests so deforestation is not really a threat for them they are mainly found in agricultural lands and scrub lands because they mainly hunt rats rodents bandicoots etc so they help the farmers by clearing the rodents and they thrive and survive as well so you find healthy numbers of the owl in the country it's not a threatened species it's of least concern according to its IUCN conservation status. The CITES convention has listed it on appendix 2 to regulate its trade, its international trade. Alright, so please note down these important basic facts which could be relevant for your prelims. So this concludes my comprehensive discussion of today's The Hindu Newspaper. Please take a look at the main practice questions. Try and write your answers. I've already discussed these topics in exactly the order in which you can structure and build your own answers. So I expect you guys to write the answer and post the answers in the answer rating portal for which link has been given in the description box. Don't forget, head to the Telegram channel now. You'll get some questions on these articles. It'll help you revise these topics again. I hope you guys liked the session today. Do let me know in the comments. Press the like button and share it with other aspirants as well. That's it from my side. Thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a good day.